I usually don't do the introduction because uh, I'm not great at it, so I just skip sure. it. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, no the first thing that I'd like to ask is about squat, full squat, specific squat, because uh, I play semi-professional, I play as a footballer in a semi-professional club. Yeah. And uh, like the idea is that footballers should do like full squ half squat or quarter squat because it's more sport specific instead of a full squat. Sure. Uh, what do you think about it? Because I've got my opinion, but I want to listen to yours first. Um, I mean, to, 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 to be conservative and cover my bases, I'd probably say a mixture. Okay. Um, I always tended to use, whenever I was squatting, I always tended to use like warming up into my max weight with full squats and then perform my higher weight reps with a partial squat. Okay. So like a half squat. Um, my, my bias generally is tends towards full range um, all the time, whenever possible. It's more efficient generally. Um, from the last I checked, you build more strength and more muscle mass from full range. Um, and I think from an injury prevention perspective, if you've got a range of motion, but you don't have full strength or control through it, um, then you're more likely to injure yourself when you take yourself to that end range um, in your daily life or in your sport. You know, uh, a lot of, you don't have full control over what happens when you're, you know, doing day-to-day -day life or if you're kind of in a match. And so if you train regularly towards your end of ranges and are comfortable and efficient at managing loads and force at that end of range, then you're less likely to um, end up with an injury. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because uh, I also have a bias towards full squat. I think that if I do like half squat or quarter squat, uh, I strengthen my muscle and my pattern, which is maybe similar to what I do then in the game, like uh, jumping or sprinting. But from an injury prevention standpoint, I think that I don't strengthen my ligaments, tendons, and then um, basically my joints are not used to go to the range of motion with the stress, without like an overload stress. Mm -hmm. So I, use, I usually always do as to grass squat. So. Yeah, yeah. And what about single uh, unilateral movement? Do you prefer unilateral or bilateral or a mixture uh, works well again again a combination of both um but i i tend towards unilateral movements okay as a rule um partially because of the way i train um it's just i don't i, I don't have access to gym equipment often um so i, I tend towards single leg stuff because you require less require less equipment um but i also think that most sports and most of life happens on one leg you know or it happens unequally um so i train in that way um generally more more than more often than not i do single lap single leg work and i and i give my clients unilateral work um okay. Uh, now, why, why do I do that? Um, I think, for example, if you focus on a split squat okay. rather than a back squat, you're going to gain in a split squat. You're going to gain strength in a full back squat by doing a split squat, but you're also going to gain balance you're also going to work out any imbalances that there are between one side and the other you're also going to find out what those imbalances are as you train um, now there's nothing necessarily wrong with loading an imbalance generally speaking there's nothing particularly wrong with it from a from a pain or injury perspective um but 
at least from you know at least from the literature and from the evidence you know there's nothing necessarily wrong with it but i think in terms of training efficiently and reducing your risk of injury and being conservative i would always tend towards unilateral training okay okay because uh, being honest uh, up until a few months ago I, i've always done uh, bilateral training because um, uh, i think like for uh, maximize your strength gains it's better mm -hmm. because of, of course you can uh, put more load on the bar, for instance. Mm -hmm. In the back squat, you can maybe put 100 kg, one in a split squat, you can put much, much less. Yeah. But recently, I discovered the knees over toes guy. Uh, yeah. uh, and his content is amazing, honestly. And I started incorporating ITG split squats. Yeah. And um, I, wasn't, I was kind of skeptical because uh, the kind of lunge, in, it's kind of funny to me because you have to push them kind of backwards to get into upright position. Mm -hmm. It's a weird movement to me, mm -hmm. but I felt the benefits in terms of uh, proprioception balance uh, and the muscle connection with the mm -hmm. muscle mind connection. Yeah. So yeah, ATG split squat is great. Uh, what about Cossack squat? Because uh, most of the people don't don't usually train the lateral movements, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, goblet squat. I saw your post about goblet squats. Uh, what about yeah. Cossack squat, in which you basically go um, kind of ass to grass with your uh, glutes yeah. almost touching your osseous? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, the first point you make there about training lateral movements, I think is really important. Um, uh, quite often, so quite often when I'm assessing somebody for an injury, if I'm assessing an athlete for injuries or particularly recurrent injuries, you know, a recurrent theme of injuries, um, quite often it's looking for the patterns of training that they're really strong in and then finding, finding what they're not doing, basically. Okay. And most, most athletes, most people will have either particular movements that they avoid or particular styles of training that they avoid because they're not strong in them and it's not comfortable or pleasant to train in areas that you're naturally weak we all gravitate we all gravitate towards the thing we're good at you know i'm not i grew up doing martial arts i'm naturally quite flexible so naturally i have a bias towards mobility style training um so I'll just lay that out there first of all like that's <laughs> that's my bias because it's also what i'm good at um you know my absolute strength i've got quite a small frame absolute strength wise i'm not you know, I'm never gonna, never gonna excel there. So, so naturally I have a bias and inclination towards unilateral mobility style training anyway. Um, but, but yes, uh, lots of people don't train, lots of kind of the standard gym stuff is all very, you know, unidimensional front and back. Um, and then people go into a sporting arena and a lot of it is twisting, turning to the side switching directions quickly side to side um and then things start to suffer because that's not they're not training that under control you know controlled environments so so things like side lunges and cossack squats are great for that um again i like the cossack squat for similar reasons to like the atg split squat um it trains you know, full range of motion. You can kind of work towards getting your knee right over your toe and your your bum down towards your heel. Um, but it also trains uh, adductor strength as well and range of motion. So again, I'm I'm kind of all about efficiency of training. And if flexibility is a goal of yours, then then you should choose strength exercises that reflect that because you can kind of hit two birds with one stone. Um, and if I can do, if I can do two or three movements in a workout rather than eight or, or eight or 10, I will always do that. Okay. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. What about Cossack squat? Do you keep your toes always on the floor or just your heels? Like, for example, if you lower mm -hmm. on the right leg, mm -hmm. what about the left foot? Just on the heel, would stay on the ground or also your toes? 
Uh, for a Cossack squat, I would tend to rotate the feet up. Okay. So I'd tend to rotate the toes up and um, up towards the sky. If I was doing a side lunge, I'd keep both, like all of the foot both on the floor. So both facing forward. Okay. Um, you can do it differently, um, but rotating the foot up and away allows you to get a greater range of motion. So it allows you to sit down further onto that heel if you've got that range to go over your toes with your knee. Okay, uh, because so I, usually, I usually rotate because I've read a um, scientific report, recent, a recent scientific report in which they basically talk about the importance of hip mobility and mm -hmm. ACL uh, prevention. In sure. yeah. So mm -hmm. I used to do that. Mm. And uh, what about... Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that goes back to the point that I mentioned earlier, which is the idea that, you know, in a sporting environment, your, your body is going to be taken into ranges of, you know, the extreme extremes of range of motion fairly regularly, or at least uncontrolled in uncontrolled ways, you're going to slide, your knee's going to come out into the side. So if you train in that way, and this is the same, same thing in, in, you know, daily life with just regular non-athletes, you know, um, you might trip, you might fall, you might have to get some, you know, awkward, awkward boxes and stuff up into the loft and walk up a ladder and, you know, over and out, you might have to pick your kid up from over the side of a chair. And so you have to lean forward and out. And so you've got all of these, there's all of these kind of false restrictions in, gym training where you know you need to have a totally flat back or you know you should never flex your spine or flexion and twisting is you know is i mean flexion and twisting is a more dangerous movement flexing your spine does load you know aspects of the connective tissue more um it is a more high risk kind of movement but if we don't train them if we don't train them in a safe environment then inevitably at some point we're gonna end up in them and if we're not conditioned for them, then that's when we're more likely to be injured. So I tend to I tend to kind of train with slightly more, you know, unorthodox movements because your body ends up in unorthodox movements quite regularly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you talked about um, um, connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen many, many experts talking about muscle fascia. Uh, which is even more important than muscles themselves. Uh, but looking on the internet, I never found exercise for uh, strengthening the muscle fascia. They usually say foam rolling or maybe primal movement kind of training, but mm -hmm. they never go into like specific, what should you do to basically strengthening your muscle fascia? Sure. Do you have an idea or did you study something about this topic? Or... Um, I have... I'm not an expert on the topic, but I have I have some some ideas. Um, so the myofascia is like intimately connected and interwoven with the muscle, with your connective tissue. It you know it's it forms the kind of it's, it's like a cling film like thickness that uh, connective tissue that kind of blends all over the place and everywhere. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention and it's very kind of, it's been quite a, like a sexy topic of the last five to 10 years. Um, maybe a little bit less so in the last couple. Um, because, you know, we, we tended to think about the body from, our, you know, our, our representations of the body came from, you know, anatomy dissection where that layer was just kind of cut away to get at the actual muscles themselves. And so it's always removed when we study muscles, when we study anatomy, it's kind of removed and we think about things in isolation and we've got this idea of this, you know, this pulley system of muscles and joints um, working kind of like a basics, a really basic physics. Uh, um, yeah, like a, just quite like a, a reductionist view of what's going on. So it gave us a kind of, you know, a much, a, a kind of cooler understanding. We've got the tensegrity model of how things are hold, held together by kind of like guide rope style tension pulling from one side to the other to keep everything together. But, but you don't need to, you don't really need to think about training it in like in another way, because whenever you're training your muscles, you're always training the myofascia. Okay. So 
because it's intimately connected. Now there's there's probably some evidence to say like dynamic stretching and more kind of um, like uh, elastic style training. Okay. So like lots of like quick repetitive movements, that kind of thing might have a little bit more of an effect on the myofascia. Um, it kind of works with its properties to make it a little bit more elastic, a little bit more, um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure about of it. Um, but it's a useful it's a useful thing to know about and think about. But actually, you don't need to do you don't need to do a huge amount with it. Um, the, the main thing that it tells us, the main thing that it really, the, the main learning from it is that you know if you've got if you've got a, a like a an incredible restriction or contracture in you know a particular muscle or a particular area, that will then have a knock on effect all throughout the system because everything is is connected and it gives us that rather than just that kind of ethereal idea that everything in the body is connected it actually gives us you know this um this connective tissue that is really connecting com like forming these myofascial trains as the um popularized by tom myers is anatomy trains idea yeah um, so to train them myofascia to be to have basically a functional body would you mm -hmm. avoid completely isolate um working a muscle in isolation or not because for instance i think about uh, football training in the gym and mm -hmm. uh, i tend to exercise such as copenhagen they train the adductors or uh, mm -hmm. nordic curl that prevents mm -hmm. in the hamstring yep. based on the on this theory where uh, where you see basically a body as a one muscle kind of thing mm -hmm. you shouldn't do this mm. No, I don't think that I don't think that's true. Um, I think everything, everything has its place. Um, training a muscle. I mean, I, for, for functional sports style stuff, the classic bodybuilding, you know, training muscles in isolation um, is probably has limited use. I think if you if you identify, if you identify a particular weakness, um, you know, if you notice that in your posterior chain, the hamstrings are particularly for some for whatever reason habits of movement an old injury that kind of thing they're struggling to activate they're struggling to engage with exercises um your body's quite good at shifting the force elsewhere along the posterior chain then isolate the hamstrings and work them it like work, always go for the weak link if you're looking for injury prevention so yeah isolate them and work them um as one but i mean even even exercises like the copenhagen like Copenhagen curls or um, even, or just a plank um, or uh, Nordic curls, you're not just working the hamstrings. Um, you know, a Nordic curl, you're working that entire posterior chain. Um, so you're working your calves, you're working your hamstrings, you're working your glutes, you're working your lower back, um, you're even working your upper back and neck musculature um, when you're doing that movement to control everything down. So. Um, it's actually quite hard to find an exercise that just works one muscle in isolation um, because that's just not how the body works. It's how we think about the body, but it's just not how the body works. So generally speaking, when, when training, I tend to think about movements, not muscles. Yeah, you know, the kind of classic, you know, push, pull, push, pull squat, hinge, push. yeah, fold forward, lift up, you know, like, I, yeah, you think about muscles, you think about movements like that. And then if you find, if you do, if you've got an actual, if there's an injury going on or you're doing like pre-screening um, ahead of a season, you know, when you find a particular weakness through, um, you know, an assessment, then, then you might think about specific muscles. Um, but that's not, yeah, that's not a kind of a general rule. That's just for. Okay. Okay. And when you were doing Taekwondo, um, mm -hmm. how did you basically prepare your body in the gym? Like, did you do other than skill training? How was your gym training? So, I mean, I, I didn't do it. Uh, I did it when I was, so I did it from like age five to 18. And there wasn't much of a focus really on like S&C for Taekwondo. So we tended to do um look at it back at me now we trained pretty badly and it's kind of why <laughs> it's kind of why my, well one part one of the reasons that my body kind of fell apart at age 18 uh, um 
so yeah we didn't train too well uh, we did lots of lots of like high intensity lots of high intensity cardio type work lots of skill based training lots of ballistic stretching um lots of very intense static stretching um but i don't think i don't think i really i didn't really get into the gym until i was 18 oh, okay. 19 maybe yeah we didn't we didn't really focus on that at all and i didn't really focus on it at all uh, what about mental training did you do like or are you doing visualization or mindfulness before training or after training was it not not when i was training for taekwondo no um i've learned all of that stuff afterwards okay but at the time no I, the training the training was looking back at it the training was pretty rudimentary um and fairly yeah poor of a poor quality i would say okay. um, and what do you think about mental training because i'm a huge fan of visualization not yeah. in terms of law of attraction in terms of like visualizing basically a a movement, a specific mm. movement that then you perform in uh, football, for instance. Yeah. And then when you do in real life that movement, you feel much more um, comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Visual visualize yeah. visualization is yeah very important, hugely important, particularly um, particularly when an athlete is injured and can't actually do a lot of the stuff that they want to do. You know, just actually watching, you know, even just watching other, you know, let's say tennis players play tennis, their mind is going through the motions of it and they can visualize themselves and actually retain some of the motor patterning and control um, that uh, that they might otherwise lose to lack of practice. So, yeah, really important. Um, mindfulness. So, yeah, the, the mental training, I think. So mental training, I think, covers a lot more than just those kind of techniques. Yeah. Uh, like they're super useful. Like you know, mindfulness meditation is incredibly useful. My my, you know, the bulk of my work is with like pain and injury, um, and mindfulness can, is incredibly effective. Well, for some people, for that, some people it doesn't really tend to doesn't tend to. Um, some people don't get on with it very well. Let's say. Okay. Um, but when it comes to getting injured, um, psychology is far more important than we give it credit for. Um, but because most of us are not trained to really think about it or we don't have interventions to kind of deal with it, or it's a bit uncomfortable for some people to, to delve into those kind of things, you know, most, most injuries boil down to, you know, poor training habits, um, doing too much too quickly, um, doing too much at the wrong time. And most people know what not doing, not doing the things that they should be doing, that they know they should be doing. You know, so most people know how they, a lot of the time they know what they should be doing differently to avoid the risk of injury or to train more effectively, but then actually doing it, you know, compliance with that kind of stuff is, is the tricky bit um so actually uh yeah coaching people to to essentially look after themselves in the way they kind of should is is a big part of my my role um yeah. and and a lot more yeah it's a lot more what would i say ethereal it's more of an art it's, you know there's not there's not so many things that you can measure when it comes yeah. to psychology and that's why we feel more uncomfortable with it particularly when we're used to measuring, you know, angles, ranges of motion, we've got physiology in front of us, we've got muscle tissue we can look at, but actually getting into kind of people's beliefs around training, people's habits, why they're training, why they need to do all the volume they're doing, you know, what, what is it that's, what is it that's driving them to do all of that and keep getting re-injured and why can't they, you know, take more rest days, for example, you know, uh, most athletes, the idea of a rest day is kind of hell. <laughs> Cool. And for most for most gym trainers, the idea of a deload week is just disgusting. Like, but but we know the benefits of it. We know it makes a huge difference. We know we should be prioritizing proper rest and recovery. So, you know, why can we do it? What are we not like, you know, what what need is the training filling for us that resting then blah, makes us so like puts us on edge. So it's 
yeah, mental training is a big, you know, big topic, mindset training, yes. um, coaching, all of those kind of things. Yeah, I, I've been guilty of that for many years, honestly, from like 14 to 19, I would say. I don't think I've more than one day off per uh, every two mm-hmm. weeks. I've never taken any day off every two, any, every two weeks. Yeah. And in every single training, I was doing 100% because I was thinking that yeah. okay, if I don't do 100%, I'm not going to get results. Yeah. Instead, sometimes you have to balance stress, mm-hmm. recovery, and adaptation. Yeah. There isn't the recovery, there isn't any adaptation. Yeah. And about mental training, uh, uh, there is uh, a training that in, Ita- in, in Italian is called training autogeno. I looked for uh, in the English translation, but there is nothing. I would okay. say autogen training, which is based basically on uh, focusing, for instance, on the right leg, then left leg, then arms, and any part of your body. And you, you have to feel that part really heavy, like uh, you repeat. Um, in your mind, for instance, my right leg is heavy, my right leg is really okay. heavy over a few times. And uh, basically, many studies show that it improves like um, calm during a stress, stress uh, okay. environment, sure. focus, but I've never found anything in English, only in Italian. So <laughs> I see, it sounds like a form of body scan meditation. Yes, yes. kind of body scan. Yeah. I mean, I haven't heard of that one specifically, okay. um, but it sounds interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think other forms of body scan meditation and, and you know, meditation in general, that, that brings us onto the whole topic of kind of the stress response, um, you know, how people, how people respond and modulate, you know, their own nervous system, being able to switch back and forth readily between, you know, fight and flight, sympathetic, you know, go, 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 yeah. um, and then dropping back into, you know, more, you know, switching more to a focus on parasympathetics, resting, recovery. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, that's a real struggle. First of all, one of the things, you know, one of the things that modulates that when we grow up and modulates it in the animal environment is play. So one of the most important things for actually training and learning how to modulate and be able to switch in and out of those two sides. I mean, it's an oversimplification, but serves the purpose um, of those two sides of your nervous system is, is playing. So, you know, play fighting, uh, just playing as a kid, you kind of go from laughing and, uh, you know, running around laughing to then like, having a fight and being like on it and and then back to play back to laughing back to you know so that kind of learning how to do that and modulate it is really important and we kind of we tend to get rid of or lots of training schools and um as you get older the play element of it we lose it everything gets a bit too regimented everything gets a bit too serious we need to follow the science, you know, letter by letter. And actually what we kind of ignore is this kind of natural built in mechanism to learn to regulate our own internal world and and our social you know, lives um, much more effectively than we can do by reductionist methods. And that's simply playing. Um, so actually like free play of the sport as a big part of your training is super important. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then the mindfulness techniques, going back to the mindfulness methods, I mean, generally speaking, our modern world is kind of set up to keep us focused, like highly, highly like sympathetically aroused all of the time. Um, always switched on, always alert, you know, we've got phones, traffic, loud construction noises in cities, like that kind of thing. Can't see the horizon. Um, and you know quarantine we're all isolated like all of those are just a recipe for like threat perception and you know constant um, vigilance so having techniques that actually bring us down and allow the part of our nervous system that facilitates rest and recovery is incredibly important because otherwise it's just a recipe for overtraining if we keep going back to training we're never kind of bringing ourselves down to really have good quality rest so 
you know, things like that body scan meditation you mentioned, the autogen, um, uh, mindfulness training more generally, um, you know, walks, hot baths, yoga, um, breath work, anything, anything like that that you can add in to bring yourself down when you need to is super important. Yoga, for example, has the other benefit of also, um, you know, so I, I, re I resonated a lot with your point of, you know, never giving yourself a training day, always feeling like you need to, you know, do more training, work harder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for me, finding something, finding something, one of the things I, you know, talk about a lot with people that I work with is finding something gentle that scratches that itch you know that soothes soothes the like training monkey you know that like i need to do something today you know finding something that that does that but that actually calms and facilitates you know rest so like a a, a gentle swim you know a walk yoga from yoga is my personal favorite because it does a whole lot a whole load of other things as well um having something like that that you, that, that works for you um, is another great tool in terms of reducing injury and maximizing performance because they go hand in hand. Um, those two are never, never, they're never separate. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, about like daily life habits, what do you think about, it's a bit off topic, a uh, dopamine fast. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I saw some uh, videos on YouTube like Matt Davella, do you, do you know him? Uh, I don't know the name, but I, I mean, I, I know dopamine fasting as a, as a Yeah, and concept. what do you think about it? Because uh, I've never tried, honestly, more than two, three hours or when I sleep. Mm -hmm. But I think it can have a benefit in terms of activating the parasympathetic system and uh, relax your body, your mind, especially. Have you ever tried or do you know the benefits? Um, I... I mean, I have done forms of dopamine fasting, I suppose, without really knowing that I was, you know, that I was doing dopamine fasting. I think simply, you know, so quite often haven't done it during lockdown because um, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to make my life any more uh, difficult than it, or stressful than it already is. Okay. Um, but normally I will do something like, so last year, for example, or 2019, 2020, every month I would either cut something out or do something. So every month there was something so like sugar, um, you know, whatever it was, uh, I would well, not all sugar, but just sugary snacks or, you know, some, some kind of vice, like I would cut, cut it out for 30 days or add in like a gentle run every 30 days or, you know, or a cold shower for 30 days. Um, the cutting stuff out is a is essentially a dopamine fast um you're cutting out you know my one of my main vices is you know like chocolate and sugary snacks that's kind of one of the, the biggest probably well that and my phone probably the two biggest like dopamine hits on a regular basis um so cutting that out um i do that more for discipline though that's more kind of just discipline training um uh just having building those habits where you can cut things out or add things in and stick to it on a regular basis. I think that's more just psychological training that, you know, allows you to, or just know that you can essentially just kind of get that sovereignty over your own inner world and your own mental state and your own body where kind of you can, you can exert top down control when you need to, when something gets out of whack when something gets out of balance, you know, that, you've got the capacity to just, nope, switch that off. Yeah, totally, totally. Even because uh, talking about balance and maybe having two goals in different directions uh, to have balance. And um, do you know, I guess, you know, Ido Portal. Mm -hmm. um, he made a, a really good post about uh, how um, basically focus aiming at two different goals, completely different, uh, brings like a balance and in his performance and health. For example, talking about armstrings and posterior chain, doing mm -hmm. Nordic curl, which is like more stress and strength mm -hmm. training, and Jefferson 
Jefferson Carl, which is based sure. on uh, stretching and uh, kind of yeah. relaxation. And uh, have you ever tried to incorporate these two uh, methodology together? Because uh, if I think about the gym, people that go in the gym or whatever, mm -hmm. they tend to do, for instance, either uh, bodybuilding or uh, running, but mm -hmm. usually people don't mix their goals, like completely different yeah. goals together. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, I kind of advocate that quite a lot as a way of, um, cause most, I mean, so you've got two different, you've kind of got two different spheres. You've got, you know, competitive athletes where there's only so much mixing they're doing because they're building a highly specialized body for a certain thing. So they'll need to do a little bit of other things to keep things in check and in balance. Um, you know, so like there's a big, there's a big push at the moment for lots of athletes to take up yoga and it's getting quite popular, like yoga for athletes, because it, if it does all of those things, you know, regulate muscle tone, relaxation, etc. But that wants to be like a bit part because they need to be, you know, you don't, you don't want to be um, like a javelin thrower who's focusing loads on endurance running like it's just you're just not going to be a very good javelin thrower if, if you put too much focus on endurance running so um for athletes it's a little bit limited um and you know but Ido portal's not talking for for athletes necessarily you know he's talking for movement generalists um and i think i, I would very much advocate being a movement generalist or an ad, ex exercise generalist for most of the population um so yeah so for example my training at the moment is you know one or two one one heavy strength session a week you know, maximal intensity one medium maintenance of anything i'm not pushing you know not trying to build in you know in a particular direction and then mobility or like stretch stretch style or flexibility style work um, because that's one of my goals most days and it can be done most days and then uh, two or three super light jog slash walks you know zone two maybe oh. zone three but zone two or zone three style training for the rest of the time so I'm kind of polarized training there's like 20% maximal intensity the rest of it's super light and easy um, but I'll switch up what I do in you know in terms of like I'll just do different sports or different things quite regularly because it brings balance. It brings like roundedness to your body and also just your life. Um, if you, if you hyper specialize, you tend to train, you become super, you know, developed in one area and then other areas suffer and that will either be a recipe for injury or um, well, and then whatever else follows after an injury. I personally think that the more uh, the more your training is generalized, the more uh, the longer you can perform at your sport. For example, if you train yeah. as a footballer or a tennis player, only uh, your specific skills every day, every week, you don't mm -hmm. do much differentiation. At 20, 22 years old, you're going to burn out. For example, the Chinese athletes, up until yeah. they are 18, they are the best and then they disappear. But basically, yeah. because since they were uh, five, they all only do that kind of training, which yeah. is not great for the body. Yeah. And uh, if you have to choose uh, um, only four exercises that you can do in your life, incorporating yoga, strength training, uh, anything, what would you do? I, I would say my, so I'll give you an idea. Yeah, uh, sure. Trap bar, deadlift, sure. Mm -hmm. sprints, because it's like yeah. a base movement mm -hmm. is for uh, endurance yeah and uh, jumping rope or swimming i don't know which one sure hmm. yeah tough um i think yeah trap bar deadlift or like a kettlebell snatch okay would probably be one for yeah explosive strength mm, running i would probably do 
like low yeah. intensity or high intensity running? Low intensity. Okay. Um, yoga. Mm. You have to choose one except one yoga exercise. I know it's kind of impossible and minimalistic, but you got to choose one. I would just do sun salutation, which is pretty much all I do anyway. Okay. So it's like four exercises or five, but it's like one flow. That's 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 all I do. Yeah, that's probably what I do. Um, yeah, and then so yeah, I probably do something like I probably do either like uh, probably like trap bar deadlift and one arm chin up work, or swing or kettlebell swing and one arm chin up work. Okay. That would probably be. It yeah. sounds good. It sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> And the uh, last question, then I'll let you go. Um, sure. Top three podcasts slash uh, people that you follow in the strength and conditioning slash mobility uh, environment? Mm, good question. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, I'll just be like what I'm, as in at the moment, uh, what I'm following more of. Uh, let's stick with like strength training or strength and mobility stuff um the mindful mover on instagram is fantastic i think for for my bias of training um in terms of minimal minimal input for maximum output that's that's his that's his focus and i, I like that um i really like gmb's work um i really like their their style of playful training um and they put out lots of good content on injury prevention um just yeah lots of good content generally um the, the importance of play and things like that how is it spelled sorry this one uh G -M -B. G -M -B. yeah okay. i think it's i think it's gold medal bodies i think it is but the website gmb.io okay yeah but it's it's kind of Ida portal -esque, but just a lot less pretentious. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, a lot more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and a lot more playful. Um, and yeah. And there's, there's three of them. One of them's a physio. One of them's like does loads of, loads of things. And then who else would I put? I'd probably put somebody um, uh, injury work wise. Someone like, uh, like Dr. Sam Spinelli, I think. Um, uh, what's his tagline? There's, I can't remember what his um, Instagram tag. He's 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 a he's a S and C coach and physio. Okay. Um, so it's just lots of like lots of really well um, well evidence based uh, education on like how to resolve injuries injury prevention, strength training, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's Dr. Sam Spinelli. Let me just check that. Yeah, I'm going to put it on in the description anyway. So is he on Instagram, right? Yeah. I think it's him. He's got, a, he's got another tagline, I think, but I can't remember what it is. There's a, there's a few in that, that field. Um, it's one of those ones, if you follow him on Instagram, you'll find all of the other ones that are quite similar and quite good. Wow. But he's, he, oh, it's, it's not him I mean, but he's one of them. I can't remember the one I mean now. Oh, no, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is him. But yeah, yeah, he's, he's great. Awesome. It's just kind of no nonsense, no, non, no nonsense strength training and physio stuff, but puts out a lot of evidence-based, evidence-based stuff. And of people that you know, who would you recommend to talk to uh, about anything? Not your uh, your niche, like maybe you know some experts in isometric training, for example, or uh, plyometric ballistic. Who do you know as an expert? Um, so I've got a, a good friend of mine I train with, uh, Kuba, Kuba Yerza. He um, it's probably like natural strength, parkour, um, mobility style, Edo, Edo Portal style training stuff. Um, but he, yeah, calisthenics. 
he's probably great to talk to. Um, do I know anybody else? Um, that's all I can think of on the top of my head. Mental training or uh, cardio sprints? Because I'm gonna contact them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but if I, if it, somebody else comes to mind that I'm that I know, okay. then I will let you know. Yeah, that you should talk to. Yeah. For example, Ross Mitchell recommended me uh, Chris Walker, the jump rope coach. Okay. Uh, he's amazing with jump rope and uh, okay. the knowledge yeah, of it. Yeah, I don't know him. Yeah. And yeah, anyway, thanks for the 50 minutes that you waste. <laughs> My pleasure. No, it's, it's, it was a good chat. I enjoyed it. And yeah. uh, la really last question. Your goal in five years, physically and uh, as a personal trainer slash uh, mobility coach? Five-year goal. Um, well, I'm just finishing my degree in osteopathy, um, so so it will probably be to um, yeah have a have a be running my practice in osteopathy, working with um, yeah it's, uh, injuries and um, chronic pain uh, will be my main focus. Um, yeah, physically for myself, uh, I'd like to be able to do a probably do a one arm chin up and be able to comfortably run for like seven hours <laughs> do, do like a seven hour seven hour run like so, nice and polarized david, <laughs> nice Goggin, and david Goggin style yeah just yeah run for a day or cycle for a day you know i'll never do that i guess <laughs> it's too much well, well I'll, I'll see I'll, I'll let you know if i do okay <laughs> thank you very much for your time have a great yeah. day yeah you too take care